If you've been listening to the show for the past six months, you've been hearing me talk about a personal project I'm doing that I was going to launch on Kickstarter called the Drifting Moon Tarot. It's a tarot deck and it is live on Kickstarter right now. It is currently up and I just wanted to make that announcement. A tarot deck is a deck of cards that each card has a different theme. And my job as an illustrator was to figure out the stories and the symbols and the meanings behind these cards and the different themes. And so it was a really fun, almost like a narrative kind of project, but applying it to a deck of cards. And so I'd love for you guys to go check those out on Kickstarter. We do have a link in the show notes here on this episode, and you could also go to Kickstarter and just look up Drifting Moon Tarot. As you know, us here at Three Point Perspective, we are very big on artists making projects that they are passionate about. And the only way these projects work is if you guys support them. We love the idea of taking a little bit of power away from the big companies and, and giving it back to the artists. And that's what these things are. That's what this project is for me. It took the last six months off of commercial work just to do this project. Project. And uh, so I would love to ask for your support and your help. And uh, if you like the project, share it around. I would really, really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all illustrated for all the major publications in the business. We've all taught illustration at university art schools, and together we publish somewhere around 75 children's books. That is right. Each week we come at you guys with listener questions or interviews. Uh, sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you're going to learn something brand spanking new. Lee, what's your question that you have for us? My question is, as I navigate, uh, you guys are probably listening to this later after my Kickstarter is already launched, but I'm in the, the thick of it right now, getting prepping for this thing. And mm, so I'm posting. Bitcoin. Yeah, buy Bitcoin. Yeah, it's, everything's <laughs> low right now. I should. Uh, my question is, um, I just I just think other people are going to run into some of the stuff that I'm running into. Um, on Insta, you know, you, your projects do only as well as your promotion. And... So trying to promote on Instagram, you know, social media, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Jake Parker being the expert on Instagram, what I've noticed over the past mm, six months is posting and I, I get good engagement, but mm -hmm. also there's like, I get these little replies. Oh, promote this thing on uh, independent artists. And then you go over there and it'll be, they have like, you know, half a million um, followers or a million or whatever. And then you look at the actual posts that are there and A, the quality suspect, and then B, the engagement is actually low, even if the views are high, like it's a video, it's got 70,000 views, but three likes. Yeah. Scam. Yeah. Uh, Scam. Okay. Don't What's worry going about on it. there? Are they, are they, are they, uh, like bots and getting follow? How are they getting that number of followers and then no engagement? There's, there's real engagement on line and there's, fake stuff and the fake stuff is so loud and noisy and yeah. and uh the motivations are not they're just not your people how are they getting those followers and and then no engagement so it's is it is are they is well, you it can bots? buy followers yeah you can oh, buy really? yeah. you can pay a thousand bucks and get you know five thousand followers or something like that and they're all i don't know if you've ever like go search like farms or, or view farms, farms or something like that. Oh, I've never even Click heard that farms. term before. And what you'll They're, see is these rooms in like some third world country or something. <laughs> They'll have these rooms with just cell phones lining the walls. And they're all hooked up to like one central computer. And they're all programmed to go and follow and like and, and do all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. They're all and, synchronized, uh, you mean? They're, they're, not, they're synchronized. not synchronized. They're just, <laughs> They're just doing, they're, they're following, trying to pretend to be humans. What, yeah, oh what the gosh, program is telling so them to do. Bizarre. So it looks like different accounts. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, okay. I didn't know. I mean, I thought that it was fishy and I wasn't about to like, you know, promote on one of those things, but I was just like, how are they getting so many followers and then no engagement? I just don't understand that metric. Another thing you'll find on Kickstarter is, is people emailing you and saying, Hey, I, 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 um, just backed your project. So will you back mine? And that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. It's like, <laughs> yeah. hey, I, I went and bought a watermelon today. Will you buy my wrench? I got a wrench here. You know, <laughs> you, you were selling a watermelon, so I bought it. And, I mean, that definitely like, doesn't scale. I mean, if you if you had to buy no. something from every person that buys your thing, it's kind of self defeating. Or there's, um, hey, I I liked, I love what you're doing. 
and uh, I, I gave you comments and likes and I and I promoted you on my social media. Will you do the same for me? And it's the same thing, but like their mm-hmm. their thing is their audience has nothing like yours. It's desperation from people who don't know how to promote. It's they don't know that strategy. making something amazing is really all you need to do and then mm-hmm. and then obviously share your process along the way so that you have people that know what you're doing. But if your thing is good, I mean, like a lot of the Kickstarter campaigns that I've followed that aren't even illustration related products that I've bought Mm -hmm. or almost backed, right, Mm -hmm. are things that I've seen because other people shared it. Like, I just got this thing and uh, it's amazing. And they're they're touting it. And it's someone that I know and trust. So I'm like, well, I'm going to go and look at it now. And I've bought some of those. I got to send you the new snowboarding uh, a ski rack holder that's on Kickstarter right now. Cause I'm looking for, I'm trying to transport all this gear up to the mountain and there is a Kickstarter where somebody has finally figured out how to do this correctly. Really? <laughs> cool. It's good and stuff. Lee is all about the organization. I'm all about like, I don't want to <laughs> climb on my roof after I've snowboarded for the whole day and strap snowboards to my top of my car. <laughs> See, that's the thing though. What's the difference between that though? What you're saying, Will, and like, um, like the last Kickstarter I launched, I had a section on the bottom of it that said friends of this Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. And it was like three different uh, art or illustration or comics related projects of, of like mm-hmm. people that I know. Um, it, it, I see that as yeah. being more like here is, you know, if you're interested in my stuff, you're definitely going to like this. Well, and I did the same thing with Lorenzo with the how to think when you draw. Mm-hmm. We promoted each other's um, Kickstarters because they were related. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, Will's what Will you're saying is that it they're just asking for some random thing. Whereas you're what Jake's talking about is there is a one to one relationship between the projects. Right, right. That's what they're I'm talking about. Well, the book How to Think When You Draw and uh, what they don't teach in art school are both art, but the audience is, has a huge crossover. Right, with yeah. illustrators. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. I like what I like about what you're saying there too is spread it around. Don't be stingy with your project. Some people get so nervous that somebody's going to steal their project, and it's only I only want people to buy my project. What we have found, I mean, we even we own an art school and we promote the other art schools all the time. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm not going to be selfish with that stuff. Uh, schoolism is an awesome school. I, I totally recommend them and and uh, Noman and all these other schools. Mm-hmm. Like, don't be a jerk. That's just the Exactly. I mean, and, and here's the thing too, you know that they do stuff that we don't do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and we do stuff they don't do. So it's right. like, um, and, and at the end of the day, even if you spent money on all these art schools, you're still going to be spending less than if you went to art center. Yeah. You know? Right. That's, right. <laughs> That's for sure. Like that. <laughs> That's for sure. And art is the same way too. I mean, if somebody, I'll promote, you know, Jake or Will all day long, because if somebody's going to buy if somebody's going to hire Jake, they're not going to hire me. They're not, they're not wondering which one of us they're going to hire between me and Jake or me right. and Will. Yeah, it's exactly. going to be, if, if they're going to hire Jake, they're not going to hire me and vice versa. Right. Mm-hmm. Like if you get a job, I never think, oh man, I lost a job because yeah, we took it. Exactly. I'm just like, oh, I, exactly. I wasn't up for that job at all in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, should we get right down to our first question? Let's do Let's it. Dive in. This person wishes to remain unnamed and... Mm. The title is, this is actually such an interesting like situation. So to quit or not to quit, that is the question. Uh, hello, SVS team. I often see you read letters from listeners on your podcast, and I really wanted to write in with my own question. Uh, I invite you to read this on a future episode. So here we are. For better clarity, I want you to view my website. Now, he asked to remain anonymous, so we're not going to show you his website. But here's the, here's the situation. He has been a professional freelance illustrator slash designer for over 10 years now and is currently represented by a popular um, um, rep rep agency. Mm -hmm. I think we'll keep that anonymous too. Yeah. Okay. Problem is, this is what he says, I keep running into the constant issue of having long periods of unemployment. Currently, I'm doing about three months since my last paying job, and thank goodness I have some money saved, or I'd uh, be in an, it'd be an even greater issue. 
Even then, the work is always few and far in between. Always scrounging for that next gig, I'm estimating that I apply to anywhere from 10 to 20 studio jobs a week. I also send out about 20 inquiries a week to various editors and art directors at different studios and or publishing houses. Most often, I don't, I won't hear back from my queries or I'll receive an automatic email rejection response from the companies I've applied to. It almost seems I'm on some mythical do not hire list or something as if such a thing even exists. Being represented isn't the silver bullets often made out to be either. While yes, some work has come my way via representation, I'm also competing with a very large roster of artists all vying for limited job opportunities. I'm sure there's a hierarchy involved and I'm relatively certain I'm quite low on the totem pole. Oftentimes my emails to the team at Shannon is... Uh, <laughs> I just, Mm-mm. I just ousted him. Will go Bingo. unanswered or it takes days for a response. I've been debating on whether or not I should seek alternate representation elsewhere. Basically, I've been doing this long enough that I put myself into a corner. This is interesting. I often feel like this. I really don't have any other real professional skills. It seems the constant rejection is finally catching up with me, and I'm not sure how much longer I can keep playing this game of trying to do this for a living. Quitting has been on my mind, and the passion I once had for art has been deteriorating for some time now. It's just become so exhausting to constantly receive no at every corner. I believe my work is good, could always be improved upon, or am I just being delusional? Delusional. I know how successful you three are at at what you do, and I'd absolutely welcome a real critique of my work. I'm not sugarcoating that. I'm a professional. I can take the criticism because that's how I'm going to grow. I welcome any insight Any of you could provide me about my work, along with any input you could provide me regarding my employment problems. Thanks so much for your time here. Also, thanks for sharing your knowledge with the community. You're a massive inspiration to me and so many others. Please just keep doing what you're doing. I wish you all the best. All right. Did you guys look at his his, yeah. uh, his website? I, I know um, the answer to this one, but I want to see what you guys have to say first. Well, well there's you, two you, parts. Is his it. work professional enough? And should he quit? Like should should he continue working? At All right, this? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go first. I can't. Let's wait. hear it. Dive in. The, you, the work is good, but the work is not great, and being repped by this rep is um, anytime a, a an artist rep or agent says yes, I want you in my stable of artists. It's a huge ego boost, and it basically, in in some cases, it's, and in some cases, it um, it gives you more of a positive than you deserve. I hate to say it like that, but but like, mm-hmm. but um, you're from what it sounds like, this person is from the letter wants to be an illustrator, and and basically, I. I say that's the uh, equivalent of being, you know, a hired mercenary or a hired gunslinger mm-hmm. or something. You know, it's like it's like you trade your talents for money. And then the other the other uh, way to go about it is that you create the project and then you sell the pro- the whole project. So you write the story and then you also illustrate it, right? Or you mm-hmm. write it and you illustrate it and you self publish it, um, and in order to be the gunslinger, especially on that particular website, because that rep I'm very familiar with and um, and uh, they have a ton of artists, you have to be in the top 20% if you're going to get work. I know this from talking to them. Um, I know them very, very well. And I know that and, um, the owner told me one time, look, there's the top 20% are really the only artists that are the, that we're keeping busy to where they're able to turn down work, you know, so, so much work coming in that they can turn it down. And then there's the, the middle chunk. And then there's the bottom chunk. I don't know if you're in the bottom 20% or the middle 60%, but you're not in the top 20%. And, and so that's just going to make it, um, yeah, I mean, like you, you define the problem. You can, you can do really well, not even being in the top twenty percent on a rep site like that, if you are also creating projects and staying busy um, by by writing and or creating other products um, mm-hmm. on your own, 
and using this rep to fill in to give you, um, and that's basically what I do with with uh, my rep is when projects come in, great, that's just something extra. But I am busy with so many other things that I don't rely on that income, um, you know, from from the rep. And then I get uh, illustration work on my own. Um, so that's that's my take. Is that your your choices are to and 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 let me just finish with this. My critique of your work is that you're a good designer. Your your characters are appealing, but there's nothing about the style that if I were uh, if I were a uh, if I were a client, I could interchange you with other people. Mm-hmm. I could swap you out with other people, and and that's not good. You know, you want to be you want to have the the kind of style where. It's so unique and and either so well crafted, or your or your your uh, storytelling is so good that they mm-hmm. can't live without you. They they'll wait for you. Oh, you're busy. Well, we'll wait three months or six months. Anyway, that's my take. Yeah, Lee, what's your take? It's it's tough. I'm going to throw agents under the bus now. So everybody, get ready for this <laughs> rant. <laughs> The first the problem is 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 what we expect of agents. My my problem with agents is is ideally the, the ideal situation would be an agent reps you and they maybe represent nine other people. I would say a 10 artist stable is fantastic. And that's sort of the the way that I go into these uh, some of these relationships with and 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 you know, I've, I've, I've teamed up with people that have just started their own agency or, or just signed on with a new agency. They don't have a huge roster. And then I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to get the attention I deserve. And then, or the attention that I crave. And, um, what ends up happening is they just keep signing other artists mm-hmm. and uh, more and more and more. It doesn't stop. They, it, it costs them nothing to sign another artist. And, and, and maybe you talk to that historically, it did cost them because pre- prior to the internet, when they took on a new artist, they had to make portfolios and, and get color copies and um, print postcards and deal with mail the with stuff, mail stuff and postage, all that. Yeah. And so it, so they were very, very, very choosy and selective. And the particular rep you're talking about was actually the one that revolutionized the, the repping industry. Um, yeah. The I, first was, one I was to, with them. Jake, yeah. I mean, Will was with them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it is what it is. And so, and so that's sort of why I've left the agents that I've been with is because you think it's going to be one thing. And then I don't even hear from them for six months. And then I'll look at their stable of artists. And it's like, okay, they signed 45 more artists. Yeah. It's basically, <laughs> okay. it reps used to be a, uh, a real, um, uh, relationship based business. And they, what they turned it into is more of a listing agency. Mm-hmm. They, they have a, they have a shop, an online shop where people can go shopping for an illustrator. And right. if you're not, if you um, look at the other artists on there and and maybe go through all the artists on there and, and say, you know, I'm better than this person. I'm not as good as that person, about equal to that person. If you, if you, if they have a couple hundred people and you find 40 people that are better than you, you're just not in the top 20%. Yeah, that's good. I mean, they're, they're basically yeah. using those artists to fill... Uh, work for higher gigs that the higher level artists will not take. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. That that bottom tier, they're just using you to fill in gaps. Where basically they're saying, "Okay, here's an artist. Hopefully, you need somebody." Um, so, so that's on the artist side. But going to back to what Will was saying about this specific person's website, it's kind of frustrating. But if people can't actually see it or we can't totally to de- describe it, I'd love to be able to give out, give out the link. But just to describe it, like Will said, it's good, but it is, it, it's competent. Like if this person was leaving college with this portfolio, I'd be mm-hmm. s- super stoked. I guess if they were yeah, junior, would. junior level, I'd be like, mm-hmm. okay, we can actually got to whittle this down and clean it up a little bit. Um, it's a little bit generic to me. I like mm-hmm. all the paint skills are there, but the work itself is just a little bit generic. And, and, you know, I'm, I think of, okay, this, does this person want to be a concept artist or kid lit person? You got to sort of make that decision. I don't think it works that well to be in the middle. Um, if they are going to sell themselves as a concept artist, you know, I look to artists who are getting the work like King Lee, like, um, it, you know, this person's work, there's somebody specific, there's sort of a, 
uh, 50s retro modern Mm -hmm. kind of sensibility to it, but it hasn't been pushed all the way. And so I looked to somebody like Nicholas Marley or Nate Rag. Um, Those guys are getting hired for that style and they're killing it. I mean, you go to their site and you're like, oh, that is a pretty image. You know, they're just nailing Mm -hmm. it. Um, And so I, I just think the work needs to be a little more, it feels a little generic and a little cereal box commercial to me. And you just got to be careful there because you can be competent and still not get work. Like Will said, it's not going to knock anybody's socks off when they come to your website. It just looks competent, but Mm -hmm. not hireable. Mm -hmm. So I was just looking on just the section for children's book illustration. You have 96 images (coughs) on one page. And I think that is is way too much. And and across the site, there's this um, like predisposition to show a full image and then a very tight close up of a detail on that image. And so I think you just kind of need to overhaul on your website. What I would do is get rid of eighty percent of the artwork on your website. Take the twenty uh, best awesomest <laughs> illustrations, no close-up shots, just the best killer illustrations that you got and put them on your website for each for each section, right? And then what I would do is spend some time and go make um, some personal work that that really shows like you flexing, like mm-hmm. shows that you could do some good stuff, right? Now, what is all this for? It's to either A, find a new rep, um, one that's a little more boutique one that's that's repping less people. It might be someone new who's just started. It might be uh, someone who's, who's, you know, only has, like Lee said, 10, 20 clients or something like that. But something, somebody smaller and have them rep you if you want to stay in this freelance thing. The other option I would say, if having consistent work is important to you and having sort of like not having these three month stretch, three month stretches of no work. Um, a, if you're not working for three months, dude, go make something and launch a Kickstarter, like go do make a thing like what Lee's doing. He's doing a tarot card deck. Go do it. Uh, you know, you could do your own like version of, um, of a deck of cards, of playing cards or something like that. You could partner with someone to do a board game. Find some of these indie creators and, and collaborate with them. Like you don't need an agent for some of that stuff. And mm-hmm. you can usually like you can pay the bills in between when you do that kind of stuff. Um, so there's that. But the other thing is, is you might really enjoy working for a studio in-house. And if that's the case, then you definitely need to like um, simplify your website to the top 20% of these, these, uh, illustrations and have them be like highlighted on your website as opposed to every like illustration you've done for all the projects going back 10 years or whatever. I would take the newest stuff, the best stuff, focus on that and maybe try and get into a studio. You live in Florida. I think it is. Um, you're from Seattle from your about page. So, um, I don't know if you mind moving back to Seattle, but there's a ton of studios out there. There's places in Florida, I know. There's places all along the East Coast if you're okay moving. But it might be a, a little bit better, more stable life for you to working be working in-house in one of these studios uh, because it's not on you. You still get paid if there's no work. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. on the studio. Like in between jobs, they're going to they're gonna still pay you. Um and, and you can learn a lot. You can connect with people and, and you can build that, that network working at a studio. You could still work on private personal stuff while working at a studio. You could still take on odd freelance jobs from the current um, representative that you have. Uh, but I don't think it's time to quit. I think it's time to get smart and like refine things and, and really go about this in a, in a, uh, like a, a very direct, like surgical approach. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's got kind of the perfect scenario because he's really good. Yeah. He's just not focused. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that was another thing I was going to say is um, in the letter, you say, you know, if you don't find more success, you're finding yourself losing the passion. And I totally understand that because it's, 
it's like you're you've done all this work you've earned um a lot to be working for 10 years you've worked really hard you've earned a lot to get there and you are repped by a rep that isn't going to take anybody and i don't i want to make that clear it's not like it's not like they just sign up anybody you have Mm -hmm. to be good um but my biggest advice is it, when you when you look at a Dan Sentad or a Peter Brown or a John Clausen or um, a Julia Sarda, I mean, in my mind, I, when I look at each one of those, I can name something that that each one of them is good at. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, oh, that's the artist that's really good at X. And uh, you need that factor, that X factor in your work. You need to say... I'm going to lean into this because I I look at your work and some of it looks totally uninspired and others are like, wow, that's really nice. You know, Um, that piece had, he had a lot of passion for. So yeah, like what you were saying, Jake, you got to get rid of the, the other stuff, but you need to be working towards people being able to say, Oh, that guy, he's, he's the guy that does X better than anyone else. You know, I mean, like that's really what you're trying to trying to do. That's right. Okay, next next question. This comes from Daisy. Am I pricing too high or is my speed too too slow? Hello, Jake, Lee, and Will. Thank you so much for your YouTube videos, podcasts, and classes as a, quote, self-taught artist. Content such as yours is my lifeblood. So thanks for the quality content. My question is regarding setting a price. I'm rel- relatively new to commissions. And so I've set my price for, say, stylized portrait paintings at $90. Um, you could check the check her website for examples. <clears throat> I had actually had client uh, a client bless his heart tell me that my price is too low that he's paid more for less. So I've done some research and I've come up with my current ideal pricing: thirty five dollars an hour or a two hundred dollar two hundred and eighty dollar day rate. Thing is, creating one of these portraits takes me between 10 and 15 hours. So would setting the price of $350 per portrait be, per portrait be realistic? Am I still too slow since the turnaround for a portrait painting is about two days? Recently a client showed interest in my work but passed on me when mentioned when I mentioned the price of $350. What do you all think? Thanks in advance. Uh, what do you guys think? I Looking think at Daisy's portfolio here, she is a killer portraitist, portrait mm-hmm. artist. Like these things are, these things are great. I mean, she, this is not just someone like phoning it in. This is, mm-hmm. I could see that these are 10, 15 hour like mm-hmm. jobs, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, these are really good. It's, um, it's too low. Yeah, it's too low. But, um, and so, yeah, so basically you just haven't found your 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 audience yet. And they, they aren't helping you sell it to other people. Because once you do, you'll be able to charge 350 and more. You'll be able to go on up. If you can, I'm wondering if she's working. She's probably working for photographs, right? I'm Maybe sure. I suspect. Yeah, um, yeah. It, to to describe it, it's really, really um, nice painterly kind of portraits done in. Looks like di- it's digital Photoshop. Digital. Mm-hmm. Um, very, um, ve- very painterly, and and there's some stylization. If you guys know, uh, like um, uh, Lion Decker's work and stuff, there's mm-hmm. little elements of that where you can see mm-hmm. the brush strokes and stuff. It's uh, it's really done well. Um, I what me and Will noticed when we were doing. Um, art fairs and, and, and comic cons and stuff like that is sometimes the way to get the work you want is really to, to pump up the price. I wasn't selling a ton of, uh, original art when I was at a lower tier price. I think it was, it was like $1,500 was the, Mm -hmm. what, what my average was. And I wasn't selling a lot when I raised it to 2,500, I sold way more. And there's an implied quality that we, um, that we have to our work. If you're expensive, people think, oh, this person's good. If you're charging $90 for a stylized portrait, that means that, you know, they, they, you might not value your work as, as highly as you could. And they're not going to value it that high either for 90 bucks. But if you say it's 500 bucks for a stylized portrait, then maybe they say, okay, this person knows what they're mm-hmm. doing. They're charging 
a lot of money. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, it's a double edged sword there. Yeah. I, I think there's definitely an implied, um, perception of quality when you charge more. I, I think all this, this, uh, person needs to do is paint some influencers on Instagram for free. (laughs) And, uh, I mean, that's an advantage of a portrait artist is you can appeal to people's, um, vanity, right? Mm -hmm. And you can say, reach out and say, or, you know, or just do it, you know, just take some of their Instagram photos, paint, do a portrait of them, send it to them and say, you know, will you share this on your Instagram and, and link and give me a link, you know, give me a shout out. And, uh, I think you'll have, and then you could keep your prices low and you'll get tons of work. And then yeah. you can start to raise them to, to weed some people out, you know, uh, over time. Yeah, I I mean, I'm right there with you guys. Like, raise your prices. That's okay. Um, you'll find the audience. And I love Will's um, advice. I think that's some of the best advice on marketing yourself is go paint, do a, a portrait of some of these influencers, some of these, like, people who have a million followers send it to them, especially your style. They're, they're, chances are they're going to, I mean, just send it to them, no strings attached, just for mm-hmm. the love of it, right? But chances are they are going to want to promote you and share it. I'd even go big, like draw, you know, do a portrait of The Rock, you know, mm-hmm. do a portrait of Taylor That's Swift or something like that. But you could go, yeah, I mean, you could go, you could go smaller uh, and whatnot and just, just say, I'm going to spend the next, you know, if, if you're not, If you have the time, like I'm going to spend the next six months doing one of these a month or one of these a week and, and sending these over and, and have it be like, you know, your big reach out outreach for, for your, for your style. So I think that's good. Don't short yourself. Her website is lady shamomile.inc. So that's L A D Y C H A M O M I L E dot. I N K and, uh, and, and go check out her work. She's really, mm-hmm. really good. Really good. And okay. this is, I would, I would love to hear from her again in a year. See if she's done any of this and if, if yeah. things have changed. Absolutely. She's got the skills. Okay, next next uh, question comes in from Laura. Where is the story? Any tips on making story more evident in an illustration of a quiet or even a magical moment? In a novel, we know the character's thoughts, but what can illustrators think about generally when they're trying to depict something on the uh, on the interior? Um, she says, not a specific moment like a hospital room. Thanks. I don't know what that last little... Do you understand that little bit? Not a specific a moment like a hospital room. Or does she mean a specific moment like a hospital room? That last gotta, little bit was confusing to me. I got to read the whole thing because now I'm totally confused. Where's yeah, the, the short Any tips? The short question, though, is, you know, it's easy to, like, illustrate, you know, uh, uh, let's say a person riding a bike being chased by a giant turkey or something mm-hmm. like that. Like, you know the emotion. You know that person's freaking out, right? But how do you how do you make the story more evident in a quiet moment? Say it's can, like a, 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 a kid on a swing. and You can, you can break and, the laws of physics in subtle ways. <laughs> okay. I mean, seriously, like you, could, you can have um, everything have strong shadows except except a certain character that's having this magical moment. Maybe they're not even real. Maybe, you know, you can levitate someone subtly, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there are, there are clues that you can do in a, in an illustration where you break, literally break the laws of physics. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's only on close inspection of the illustration that you even notice that there's something magical going on, something different, you know. Mm-hmm. If it's magical, that's one thing. I totally agree with Will. But what she's saying about the quiet one is it's a great question. It's a great question because what you're talking about is subtlety here. And you really need to ask yourself, what is this scene about? Why is it quiet and what's happening here? Um, there was a moment like that in one of the books that I was doing um, called Love Santa. What, I, I won't give it away, but there's this moment where this this character's really it's a it's a, the pinnacle of the whole 
story and she's by herself. She's reading this letter and it's a very important letter she's reading from her mom. Very mm-hmm. quiet. And so it's this kind of scene. And so I started to think, okay, what, how do I want this scene? It needs to feel warm. It's kind of changing her worldview. And so mm-hmm. it needs to be cozy. It needs to be intimate. It needs to be very personal to her. And so by asking myself, not not just that it's quiet, but what is it specifically? Why is it quiet? And what do I need to say here? Then I can start adding the things I need to add. Like every single thing I added in there was a personal item of her. It wasn't like a generic couch that she's sitting on. There's the lighting contributed to that overall feel. Mm -hmm. The outside, it's kind of softly snowing. Like everything goes to that quiet moment and a very personal moment. Now, other people might have a a sad, quiet moment and maybe it's different. Maybe it's raining outside. And so it's all the details that you add, but you really have to say, what am I trying to say? And then you can start adding these little subtle things like Will is saying, if it's magical, you know, slightly levitating the character or some kind of little glowing thing coming out of behind a tree or something like that, you know, all these little Mm -hmm. things, but you have to know what you're saying because you're not just trying to say, oh, it's magical or it's quiet, but there's a reason for it to be those two things. (laughs) I think you look at gesture as well, like body posture, how they hold themselves. You know, you could tell a lot about what a character is feeling by just how you, just the subtle ways that you droop a shoulder or you turn a toe in or, you know, the the angle of the head or something like that. And, and especially facial expression as well. So that kind of illustration is going to take you to, you're going to, you're going to really have to know um, character design how to put a character in a very specific nuanced pose. And I think that's important, but lighting plays a role. I mean, I mean, look at, look at film for this, you know, most films don't express, you know, you don't hear voiceover of what the person's thinking. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, in, unless it's like the 1984 Dune, you're not hearing what they're <laughs> what they're thinking out loud. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all of that has to be done visually. Um, and so a lot of times you can you can go and, on, and look at films and, and, and see what is this, you know, look up Terrence Malick. Right. This is a, he's a filmmaker who, who just is so about the quiet moments and how they how they affect, you know, the overall story and what the character's feeling, you know, is the camera position down low or is it up high? Is it close or is it far out? You know, is the lighting dark or is it light? Are there certain elements like a color that's repeated? So maybe they have a red scarf, but then there's red lilies all around them or red red poppies or something. And and those Mm -hmm. two tie into each other. Um, it it could be really symbolic and and even look at like um like animation as well um uh, if you want to blend film and, and art and what you can do um all of those things work together to like help you uh help you do the storytelling side of there, those quiet moments it, it putting visual cl- clues in there you know visual little visual things like an opened letter and uh you know a wine bottle that's almost empty because it was bad news and the person is down, you know, um, little, little things like that. M Knight gets a lot of crap, but he's, when he's good, he's good. And mm-hmm. in the sixth sense, I mean, just the, the scene at the end where the, the wife is in the chair and she drops the ring and it kind of rolls across the floor. Mm-hmm. And that's when a lot of people realize you know, it starts to it starts to dawn on him. Oh, the guy was dead the whole time. You know, she's holding on. Wait, I haven't seen this movie. Wait, thanks a lot. I was just gonna watch it this weekend. Hey, man! After a decade, it's fair game. All spoilers are fair. I do want to he emphasize was dead. what. what <laughs> do you know what's funny? I got to tell you, my my in laws went through the whole movie and never knew. They were like, I can't figure out why people thought that was such a good movie. Like, like my it was good, mother in law too. The same. Oh, Wait, really? what? What are you yeah. saying? They didn't get the end? They didn't get it. My my they in-laws were it. like, why was it so good? And so we're like, well, we're, we're dancing around it. And then finally, we're like, well, you, you know that he was dead the whole time. What? 
Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Because my mother in law was the same way. She's like, mm. he's not dead. Yeah. Yeah, he but was dead the whole I time. The kid he... talked to ghosts. He was talking to him as a ghost. She's like, no, <laughs> no. I, I've never heard that happening Bless to somebody. That is, uh, that is so funny. I, I hope I never get too old to, uh, to, to get understand it. the current. <laughs> you know, <laughs> kids are doing <laughs> the current art, you know, because um, I want to so, emphasize thing, though, before I'm, I forget I'm, it. Let me let me dive in. Go ahead, Jake. You got something? Does it to? have to do with Sixth Sense? No. Go ahead and finish. Okay, your let me sense let story. me just finish. <laughs> the same woman. I love her to death. I I really do. But I learned a lesson. I should have learned my lesson with the Sixth Sense. But <laughs> a few years later, I'm like, let's watch a movie. Okay, how about The Prestige? Oh. So. <laughs> Have you ever seen The Prestige? Oh, yeah. I haven't seen that one. Oh, okay. Lee. Do I, is it a good one? Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. This is, yes. you, you have to watch this movie. The, oh, let me write I it down because I, I don't even know that movie. Seen it. It's, I don't it's, even it's, know that it's a movie. What? It's, I've never uh, heard do, you, do you like Christopher Nolan films? Yeah. It's about as Nolan-y as you can get. You, you guys are hearing this, you know, weeks after this moment happened, but I'm here in real time. Right. Wrote it down. Getting to experience the fact that Lee doesn't know the prestige. Okay. <laughs> what are you kids watching? <laughs> Anyways, so you know with Christopher Nolan, like he does things with the timeline, how you you're watching, you know, you don't know if you're watching the beginning of the story or the end of the story at the beginning. Right. And and the prestige is like, you know, just a prime example of that. And and the prestige also has like just like with most of these films there's there's sort of a, a nolan film sort of has like a not a twist but like a revelation at the mm-hmm. end or, or something like that so this was the the woman that that didn't know that the, the guy was dead in the sixth sense is not the person you want to watch the prestige with because okay. she you was gotta, just you gotta like piece some what stuff the together. heck is happening <laughs> lee gosh. tonight all right uh, it's on my you can list thank us right now Hey, speaking of recommendations, though, I don't want to uh, get too derailed, but the um, League of Legends. Mm-hmm. What do you think, that. Will? It's, it's, so it's really good. good. Yeah. If you're an artist, you have to watch this movie because I'm not easily impressed with the animation stuff. But man, this knocked my socks off. It's What's so amazing good. about it is that every frame looks like a painting. It does. It's every, amazing. Every frame. And you don't know where the, the map painting ends and the is, that, and is it 3D? Yeah. Okay. Painted, I, I, it, I figured so it had to be. So that's texture mapped on a 3D surface, but painterly. Yeah. Is yeah. that is that yeah. how that's done? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is gorgeous. Like if you want to study composition, freeze any moment, like Jake's saying, throughout the mm-hmm. entire series of uh what's what's the, the official title? Arcane. Mm-hmm. League of Legends, something think. like that. Or, Do you think they look up? Uh, you, you type in yeah. that, you'll get it. You'll it's find arcane. it. It's so but good. Do you think that they rotoscope? Like, how are they? I don't know. No, 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 no. They make a, a CG like a, a traditional model. This they is my just ignorance. Paint. On... No, they just instead of using photos for textures, uh-huh. they use paint. They paint. Yeah, it's it. just a painterly texture. There was, but there's no oh, actors yeah. that were involved. I mean, it's so volumetric. It, right. It's crazy. You if you're in a, are like they the using motion? actors, live actors to model from? I don't. Oh, you're saying the I, animation is that good for the like I, the animation? Maybe? Yeah. For, oh, so that's called motion capture, like that type of thing. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know about that. I watched a little bit of it, Lee, too. Like, yeah, it's it's super cool. I would probably. I'll have to look into that. Video games do like to use motion capture for a lot of their animation, but then it goes through the hands of a of an animator uh-huh. to give it more. Sometimes it actually looks fake when you use real human. Uh, movement. Yeah, okay. right. And you have to have an animator go in and like make it more expressive and and okay. you know all that kind of stuff. But but yeah, this is this is really top level stuff. And again, I, I hold your thought, Lee, but I want to say. Uh, Back when Pixar was every year coming out with like a new movie that pushed the the art form, that pushed the realism. Now we've got hair. Now we've got, you mm-hmm. know, uh, skin textures. Now we've got pores. And you had like all the CG was like, we've got to make it realistic. We've got to make it realistic. I was like, you know, at some point, 
they're just going to get to a point where you can't get any more realistic mm -hmm. and the real expression is going to come. How artistic can mm -hmm. you make it? And we're finally at that point. I think it really started with, um, the, the, we crossed the threshold with the, the Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Yeah. Where yeah. it's like, okay, we've got all the tools. We can make everything as realistic as we want to be, but let's see how artistic we could take it. And, and it was and so Arcane good. And Arcane is like yeah. another level of that. Yeah. It's just so pretty. It's it's just so good. I'm I'm watching it and I'm wanting I'm watching it with my family, but I want to stop each frame almost to just say, okay, I'm gonna use that color combination at some point. I mean, they keyed all the color the palettes are Will Terry beautiful. I would think that that's why I was watching. I was thinking, well, this is Will Terry right there. Like yeah, there's a bunch of fun. palettes. It's good. So you guys check that out for sure. What I was going to say back to our original topic that we started about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> Jake was talking about how important the um the uh, gesture is. And I just want to emphasize that because you don't realize how, um, it's easy with, if you're having like a swashbuckling, like, you know, sword fight on the deck of a ship, that's an easy gesture to do. You know, mm -hmm. they're in that classic kind of sword fighter motion and they're fighting. That's easy, but subtle, quiet poses are so effective, but they're very, very, very subtle. And, and a lot of artists have trouble with that subtlety because we get used to doing these grand gestures mm -hmm. when you're in school. Um, and so my little exercise for you guys listening, if you, if you're not driving a car right now is to stand in a neutral pose and think of like, I'm trying to think of like a subtle moment. Like say, say you're a kid at a new school, you're in first or second grade, third grade, you're a kid at a new school, you're in front of the class and your teacher's introducing you and you're super shy. There's subtle shifts of your body from that neutral, mm -hmm. I'm just standing there in line kind of pose to the shoulders kind of roll inward, the feet kind of turn slightly inward so the knees are facing each other versus going outward. There's all these little subtle cues that start to happen. All of a sudden you get this kind of almost, I guess, a reluctant pose or, or you know, the head goes down, but the eye glance comes up. These are the things that make a quiet moment and they're so small. Um, so you got to get it. You really have to act them out if you're going to pull off a subtle moment. Otherwise it'll look like a generic moment. Are you, so you're wanting them to actually pause yeah. the podcast right now. Pause the out. podcast, stand up. What would what the pose be? What if they're driving be? a train? Like if they're driving <laughs> a train. If, uh, again, uh, a train driver. Um, yeah, you're going to want to stop the train. That was a jerk <laughs> move, Jake. <laughs> you're going to get out. <laughs> but you think, so I used to have this assignment. It was such a fun one. I may have mentioned it before here, but it was a two part assignment for concept artists. The first one, we started off making the most early, gnarly, scary, dangerous monster that we possibly could lethal. And then the next week the, we had to put them in a scene and they had to be embarrassed. That was the pose. Mm. They were embarrassed. Mm. And that's it super, was so cool. good because there's these crazy monsters, but they have, they really had to think about what that pose was because mm. monsters generically always crush things. That's an easy thing to do. What smashing stuff, mm -hmm. but it's not so easy to make those subtle things. And so I don't know, act them out. Um, that's how you make quiet moments is, is you get into the subtle little details. If you want to, you could try pausing our YouTube video and drawing portraits of us. Like oftentimes Jake's bored, Will's <laughs> disillusioned, Lee's like vibrating. <laughs> 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 okay, I got to tell you something real quick because <laughs> people love my side stories. <laughs> okay. Uh, David Hone was listening to our, our our podcast and he was trying to go back and get some specific spot, get some specific thing that we said. Um, mm -hmm. And he's listening to it at two times the speed. Mm -hmm. And he said, Jake sounds like he's just talking a little bit faster. Will, strangely enough, sounds normal. At, at 2x speed and, and then he said and then my parts would come and he's like it sounds like you're like a crazy deranged like squirrel or something <laughs> it's, it's like so okay I could, I could see that are you saying I need to speed up and talk faster <laughs> I think we I'm fast talker Jake's a, the, the the normal middle guy and then get and your was a slow ben talker. Shapiro going <laughs> can't even understand that guy um, all right. Do we have time for, for one more, that one that we didn't get to last week? Yeah. Let's bang it out. This? <laughs> Quick okay. hit. This one raised so many red flags for me when I, when I read it. 
Okay, this comes from Kayleen. Kids book or comic? Which is better for the beginner storyteller? I really like the concept art and character design, but I want to get better at storytelling so I can make graphic novels and maybe do storyboarding for animation. First off, first red flag. Doing graphic novels and doing storyboards are two entirely different skill sets. There's a little bit of overlap, but they are... Doing storyboards for animation is a completely different path than doing graphic novels. There's mm-hmm. people who can do both, but just because you can do one doesn't mean you can you can do the other. So that that was like the first sort of red flag. If you think that these skills easily transition, you can easily transition between the two. It's it's not as easy as that. Okay, moving forward. In the past, I usually left them unfinished at early stages. Should I uh, usually left them unfinished? So I'm, I'm assuming graphic novels or storyboarding uh, was usually left unfinished at early stages. Stages. So should I dive headfirst in and make a web comic by writing the story as I go and have the original version be in print format, then modify for webtoon, or should I start with shorter stories like children's picture books where I can plan out the whole story before illustrating? Another thing, just because this is all, it's so all over the place. Just because you can do a comic doesn't mean you could do a children's picture book. Again, some skills overlap, but they're entirely their own like skill set and and own like creative pathway. Um, so then she lists potential story ideas for kids books and also examples of kind of the artists that she's looking at for for reference. And these artists are kind of the same. Um, I guess they would all sort of somewhat be in the same genre of style, but I just want to clear up this thing. And I kind of see this in, in younger students, uh, students and early in their like sort of career or, or professional, um, part of their, their career. Like <clears throat> these things are so specific and, and it takes many years to get good at them that if you think i'll just do a children's book this month i'll do a web comic you know the rest of the year and then i'll also practice storyboards like you're gonna completely like destroy your chances to get good at anything by like shifting so much between all these things my advice is pick a lane stay in that lane until you get so skilled at it that you can't be ignored at it or you can't you 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 get consistent work doing that thing and then apply what you've learned in that one thing to these other areas um it's not gonna it's not one of these things where it's like well i don't have time to do a graphic novel should i just do a children's book like a children's book is such a different kind of storytelling than a graphic novel and sometimes you could spend just as much time on a children's book as you can on a graphic novel. Um, it just it just kind of frustrated me a little bit that um, that I'm worried that this person's gonna like spin their wheels and not get anything done and just get frustrated and kind of give up altogether. Any thoughts on that, you guys? Well, uh, yeah, it, it it I think it comes from. I, I mean, I remember f- feeling like this when I was in school. Yeah, me too. Not knowing. <laughs> me too. You know, like, because here's the thing, when you're in school, you're making decisions that you know are going to impact the rest of your life, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're making forks in the road that sometimes you can't go back and mm-hmm. change. Sometimes you can, but sometimes you can't. So you're, so there's some stress there. And I sense that, I mean, I, I can read myself into this question. And the, the, the thing that you need to understand, and I guess our job is to basically say, um, you know, to kind of, to kind of give guidance and my, my guidance would be, um, that you, you write your stories because you love writing the story because you have a story to tell and you love that story and you're passionate mm-hmm. about that story and you just write it and, and you let your story inform the audience, you know, like who the audience is going to be. And then you use the medium that, you can deliver that to the particular audience. So if you write a story and it's a great story, 
and you find out after you've written it, this is actually a children's story, then you use picture mm-hmm. books maybe to, mm-hmm. to, to get that story out. But if you write a story and you're like, this is an older audience, maybe it's a graphic novel or a comic. But I don't think that you just... The, the wrong way to go about it is is to be passionate about comics, but then say, well, but I think maybe I'll just do a, a, a children's book because it's shorter and it'll take me less time. It's kind of mm-hmm. what you were saying, Jake. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Lee? I agree. What Will said and you said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we you, just- <laughs> what you really want to do is your best, your best work is the work that you, um, when you wake up in the morning, you're like, I can't wait to get started on this again. Yeah. And that's really, that's ideally, that would be the only work we take on. So is, the, the original question is kids book or comic, which is better for a beginner storyteller? And I actually think that's, that's the wrong question Yeah, because the beginner storyteller needs to, needs to just learn how to tell a story mm-hmm. and, and, um, and sometimes that story is going to be a comic. Sometimes it's going to be better mm-hmm. suited, like Will said, for a for a children's book. That that said, though, a um, a comic like a graphic novel is a massive undertaking. A hundred plus pages of comic page storytelling. Mm-hmm. So what what I would do for this for this person is if graphic novels are, you know, the eventual goal. Start by doing a five-page comic story, just mm-hmm. five pages, and see how that goes. And all it has to do is take a character and have them. All they all they do they, they just want a sandwich. They want a Sammy, right? <laughs> they want a turkey Sammy, <laughs> and uh, and uh, have them like what's stopping them from doing it. How do they get creatively solve that problem and see what you could do with five pages? You're going to learn a ton about storytelling. You're going to learn a ton about sequential art. Everything you do in that five pages. Once you're done with that, do a ten page, then do a twenty page, and get a feel for it. Because like twenty pages of comics, I'm, you know, I'm doing a comic right now, and it's taken me two months to to get through 20 pages of comics with everything else that I've got going on, mm-hmm. you know. And this is me working at like fast as I can with the time that I've got. Right. So, uh, so I think there's that, I think webtoons is a great place to like throw something out there and get feedback from people. Cause they will be honest about it. You know, if, if you're not getting any traction on there, then you know, you got to get better. And if you are getting traction, then you know what's working and what isn't working. So I think that's good. You can go down there, going down that route. If you want to do a children's books, the children's book first, I would learn how to do a spot illustration, a full page illustration, and a double page spread illustration, and just do those first. Maybe with your your idea that you have. So, mm-hmm. you know, look at it. Some of her, one of the story ideas. I, well, I don't want to spread her ideas out. You know, this let's do. We'll do like a non disclosure with with the ideas that she shared. But say you wanted to do Jack and the Beanstalk. You could, you could easily get the vibe of Jack and the Beanstalk with three illustrations, and know for yourself from there if, if you have what it takes to like go and do a thirty-page, you know, children's book. Mm-hmm. So with all these things at this level that you're at now, I would just pick one lane, go down that lane, see it through, and then decide if you want to if you want to jump over to an, to another lane and try another thing as well. But, but the main thing is, is, is it does not hurt to just pick something and get good at it. And, and you got to learn a little bit. You got to ask around and see what does it, what does life look like as a professional storyboard uh, artist? What does it look like as a professional graphic novelist? Contact Mm -hmm. these people who do this and ask them and just tell me what your life is like. What can I expect? And, um, and then plan accordingly. And I, and I think that's sort of your best bet there. I will say right, Lee, that it, Lee it ran can, out of juice. So, uh, no, no, no. I got some juice. I got, I got, I got one bit of juice left. <laughs> okay. One bit of juice. <laughs> Lee juice. I do want to say that you can focus on those different things in different ways too. So uh, it doesn't have to be all or none sort of like thing. I, I do think that you can't, 
um, do them all professionally and at a super high level. But in terms of entry level work, out of those three, children's book, graphic novel, and storyboarding, storyboarding is the easiest one to get into because it has a high rate of burnout and there's a ton of need for it commercially. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. like while you're doing the you know, either a graphic novel or a children's book, you do need to pick between those two. You can sort of pay some bills and and, and, and get your feet wet with, um, with the storyboarding and just use that as your short term and then think of the other two as long term sort of marathon goals. Mm-hmm. And... Um, work that way yeah that's a good good call lee nice I, level-headed um, yeah, approach see? to that you thought thanks I wouldn't for be saving attention. your juice <laughs> for that <laughs> all right are we done here i got one more thing to say on this one so. will's got okay. some one juice. more will's got some juice <laughs> it's grape juice um a thought experiment so some willpower here yeah it's a willism well, so it so we you know, the average human lives in, here in North America, or most most countries, I would imagine, into their 70s, 80s, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so that's that's our lifespan. And as far as the as far as um, you know, the children's book career as an illustrator, that number is arbitrary. What if what if for some? Let's have a thought experiment. What if we live to 300 on average, Mm -hmm. then all three of us would be in the beginning of our children's book careers. Right. So you're, you know, Kayleen is talking about, well, you know, she's in the beginning of her storytelling career, but in that experiment, we would, we would be just learning how to do it. Mm -hmm. And we would have, you know, a lot of time to, to get even better. So the point Mm -hmm. is, we never stop learning this thing. I feel like I'm just starting to get it mm-hmm. um, in, in, into being competent at it. But if I lived to 300, I would look back at what I'm doing now and going, I had no idea what I was doing. Right. In the veteran time of my career mm-hmm. in the real world. So for whatever that's worth, I mean, we're all learning. Yeah. We're all growing. We're all growing. And, and you can come at this... Again, like I know people who started their art career at 30. Uh, We just talked to, we just interviewed um, someone who started like professionally working at 40, you know, Mm -hmm. 42 or something like that. Um, So like there's, there's time. Don't worry that you're going to run out of time, but don't like bounce back and forth. Like just sit down and learn something and commit to one thing. Mm-hmm. And, and go from there. Um, for those of you who are 300 plus years old, please <laughs> let us know your thoughts right in. <laughs> Love to hear your perspective they're, perspective on that. They're probably really good at telling stories. Absolutely. Did you ever, have you heard of Old Man's War for that sci-fi novel? Mm-mm. So it's it, really quick. It's um, the the earth is a part of like a, kind of this i don't know if it's a federation of planets but there there definitely are wars happening on other planets and earth is kind of imperialistic to some degree and they need soldiers and what they figured out is they want um what you can do is at the age of 60 or 70 or something like that you can go have your consciousness put into like a new young super body and And so they have this like army of people who are 80, 90 years old, but they have these young bodies, right? And they're going around. That would be awesome. Yeah. They're going around doing all kinds of like cool stuff. Anyways, it was just kind of an interesting thing. Like this character, he, his wife has died. I think she died of cancer a couple of years earlier. All of his kids have moved out. He's got grandkids now. He's at the end of his life. And he's like, well, I'm going to sign up for the space Marines. (laughs) (laughs) I wonder if that's too far. I wonder if that's too far off with robotics and 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 joint replacement and stuff like that. I mean, it's probably too late for Will, but me and me and Jake, <laughs> this could be a real reality for us in our old age. Yeah, yeah they'll prick your finger and, and grow a new lung <laughs> from your blood. You know, if you if you get lung cancer or something. The problem there is it's going to be overcrowding because then nobody's dying, and so we're just multiplying. We'll have colonized Mars by then, so. Plenty of space. Uh, 
<laughs> Did you know that if you broke the world down into everybody in the world down into four person groups, like we'll call them families, four person families, mm-hmm. and you gave them each an acre of land to live off of, mm-hmm. um, you could essentially fill all of Texas and still have a little bit of room left over for anybody out extra that shows up. That's how much so land, how much land there is. Yeah. Available. That's not true. It is true. I did the math. But we don't, we I don't, don't believe uh, you've done the math. I need to see the math. If you've done the math, I want to see it. I've, you, go, I'm, you go do the math yourself and then come uh, back to me when you're wrong. And I'm going to spend sorry, the next Jake. week on this. I'm going to need a couple of different graphics. I'm gonna, All you got to do. Don't get me started on how dumb we are in our city municipalities on on our current codes of not allowing people to build houses that are naturally warmed and cooled by mm-hmm. the sun. Yeah. And, that kind of just, stuff is crazy. And then it, multifamily <laughs> dwelling, they make it so difficult. Everything about yeah. that stuff is frustrating. There's so, so frustrating. Many Have you seen all those like uh, off the grid houses in New Mexico? Have you seen those like videos they, they do on them and stuff? Oh, Which they're ones? so cool. They're like earth houses. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm talking like, about. They, they yeah. I, I saw a documentary on some that they've done in Spain and, um, you know, where they, a, they use the land in a way that it, that it, I mean, just naturally doesn't need as many resources to heat it and cool it. Just that one element, you know? Right. Right. I've seen some well, of those on Tatooine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's end it there. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> place right there. Because I was about to talk Star Wars, and I, you know what happens when I talk Star Wars. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts have been Will Terry. You can find his work at willterry.com and at willterryart on Instagram. Lee White at leewhiteillustration.com and at leewhiteillo on Instagram. And I'm Jake Parker at mrjakeparker.com and at jakeparker on Instagram. Podcast produced by Daniel2 at daniel2.co. That's danieltu.co. Special thanks to Master of Production, David Bro, Keeper of the Curriculum, Awesome Shirt Lift, uh, Chief Operations Officer, Lisa Fott, and a thank you to Lily Howell for all our show notes now. Go draw something.